Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. My name is Matthew Brenner, and today I'm with the founder of McDojo. And if you listen to the first episode, you'll know how how awesome and fun it was. And today we're going to talk about a bunch of life updates that's happened since then, a uh, a new position that he has as VP. So if you don't know who who uh, or what McDojo life is, you got to go check it out on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. They have over one and a half million uh, subscribers across all the social media channels. And one of my favorite accounts on the internet, um, if you're a martial artist, it's like a no brainer. Like, how could you not follow this account? But even if you're not, uh, just the entertainment value and all the crazy people he has to deal with is wonderful. So uh, thank you so much for coming on here. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a while. Uh, so I know you just became a vice president of a new company, or maybe I don't know if it's new or not, but I guess we can talk about that, that helps certify martial arts schools as being safe and their lineage. Tell us about, about what that is. Yeah, so I just, it's, it is new. So I am uh, the executive vice president of a company called Academy Safe. And Academy Safe was founded by Milton. Milton is actually the guy who runs a jujitsu dummies podcast. And he has a few other businesses, but He's had some incidents in the past where he's had issues inside facilities. Um, all I deal with is issues inside martial arts facilities. And the, the the biggest issue we really have is there are no regulatory bodies. There's nothing that exists. So our goal was to create a regulatory body that doesn't actually do anything but inform the public of truth. That's it. So we're not going to go in. We're not going to, like, badmouth anyone. We're just simply going to show the schools that have done well. Um, we're creating a website now where you'll be able to look up martial arts studios, almost like an Angie's List in a way. And inside that website, you'll be able to see if these martial arts facilities have become Academy Safe certified. Now, some martial arts studios might only tick a few of the boxes that I'm about to talk about. But if the ones that tick all of the boxes I'm about to say are going to be certified Academy Safe, so that obviously we cannot predict future behavior. But the best way to predict future behaviors, previous behaviors. So Academy Safe's goal is to let the public know about their behavior. So one, uh, CPR first aid certification, it's not required. You don't have to do it. But if martial arts schools are doing that, they're keeping their students safer. Uh, local federal background checks, no martial arts studio whatsoever ever has to perform a background check. And uh, I'm going through a lawsuit where a martial arts studio actually hired a registered sex offender and allow him to teach around children. And it was 100% legal for them to do so. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is that because there are no background checks required, you might have a registered sex offender teaching your child right now. And it might not be illegal for them to do. Um, defibrillators on site, sudden cardiac arrest is something that happens all over the world constantly. Um, having a defibrillator on site can save lives, especially in a strenuous activity like martial arts. Um, verified lineage. You don't have to actually have ever trained martial arts ever to open up a martial arts studio, but lineage is a good way of knowing who they trained with. And so we'll be able to certify that this person is who they say they are directly from the source. Um, and then I think the last one is, oh yeah, cameras inside the facility. I've done a lot of stories over the years. And those stories have almost always equaled the martial arts instructor doing something nefarious inside of the dojo. But of course, that's hearsay. So if there was a child who was molested, well, if there's no cameras inside the facility, it's very difficult for you to prove any of that. So if you actually have these cameras inside the facility, not only does it keep the martial arts student safe, but it also keeps the instructor safe. Because you can say, if you haven't done anything wrong, look, here's my cameras. Just look, you can see clearly the, the thing that is being said about me is not true or it is true. So the goal here is to try to make sure that we get away from this petty infighting that the martial arts industry loves to do, this finger pointing about things that are subjective, and we get to factual information that the public can use and make better, more informed decisions about where they want to train and give their money to. If you're listening to this right now, I'll put in the description notes the link to the website, and I'll also put in the link. I have a guide for school owners that has like a link to get a defibrillator machine, an AD machine, and a, and cameras that we use. It's not an affiliate link or anything like that. Just like the website that we use to buy it that we recommend for schools. So I'll add that in the notes too if you want to go buy that stuff. But if you don't have that, 
at a bare minimum of like an AED machine to protect if someone, uh, you know, goes under cardiac arrest, you're just doing your, doing your students a, a disservice. I mean, we had someone, um, we've had someone die on the mat, like straight up, like, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago or something. Um, now in that situation, he, he just, he literally just dropped dead. It was like, I wasn't there at the time, but, um, uh, I don't think a defibrillator would have helped in that situation, but it might have. I don't know. But that was before everyone had it. It was like before that time. But after that happened, we're like, holy crap, we need to get and machines across all of our schools. We're working on trying to make sure that we can get that out to people uh, for a super minimal cost. Because, you know, defibrillators and a like an AED is not necessarily the cheapest thing. Out of everything that I just oh, was expensive. Yeah. yeah, it's probably the only thing that is expensive. I mean... A CPR first aid certification is dirt cheap, if not free in some cases. Local federal background checks are very cheap. We're talking 30, 35 bucks, 40 bucks maybe, right? But, um, and if you can't afford to do that on maybe the two <laughs> instructors that you have at your facility, then maybe your doors are closing soon. Um, so, uh, but when it comes to AED, when it comes to security systems, we're working right now to try to get the best deals that we can. So that way, if someone does need an AED, we found a company right now that is fantastic, uh, that does everything that you really need it to do, um, and it's dirt cheap. So our goal is to work with them to try to get it as cheap as possible, where normally a defibrillator might cost you anywhere between like 2000 to like $4,500, depending on the defibrillator. A lot of companies rent them out. Our goal is to try to get them as low as humanly possible. Um, because they save lives, and the one that we found does everything. It tells you how to use it. You can't get the pads wrong. It, like, walks you through the entire process. There's an app that goes with it. So if yours is out for some reason, like it battery dies or something, it'll alert you of the nearest defibrillator. Like, it literally will save lives the way that they put it together. So um, how much is your student's life worth? I would say it should be worth <laughs> priceless. So if you spend a little extra to make sure that you have a solid defibrillator, that's awesome. But if you can't afford that high end, the top dollar, best one that you can, we're trying to make it so that way you can afford the top dollar one by working a deal with this company. So we're hoping to get defibrillators in every school around the world. How much do you think it'll cost? Like maybe you don't know the exact number, but about... I think by the time everything is said and done, we might be able to get it down to like uh, maybe $600. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that defibrillators, if you've never looked into them, again, they are expensive. And a lot of defibrillator companies don't even let you buy them. You have to rent them because they cost so much. So they'll put you on a lease and they'll be like, hey, it's $100 a month. Well, $100 a month, you know, that's an extra bill for a martial arts studio. If we can get it so that way a studio pays out a one-time deal, like, hey, you own it, it is yours, you're now in charge of maintenance and upkeep, which can be shown to you, which is easy. Make sure that you test it once a month so the battery's good, um, but we can help that with, help out with that as well. So the goal is to keep the cost down as low as possible, but having a defibrillator on site does save lives. So that's yeah. important. And if our goal as martial arts instructors is self-defense, it's very hard to defend yourself when you're in the middle of a heart attack and everybody's standing around you and doesn't know what to do. Um, mm. So let's try to protect our students. Yeah. And even besides doing the right thing, like, okay, doing the right thing is to have one for your students. And by the way, it could also be like a, a parent on the sideline who's just like watching, right? It can happen at any moment, but you're a fitness facility. So besides just like doing the right thing and having one there, it's also essentially like an insurance policy for your business. Of like, hey, someone gets on, goes into cardiac arrest, and they die, and then that family decides to sue you, and they're going to be like, oh, do you have a lawyer? Is definitely going to ask, do you have an AED machine, a defibrillator? And if you're like, uh, no, and they're like, why don't you have one? Every gym has one. Like, you could lose your business. So it's almost like an insurance policy. Besides doing the right thing, which you have, which you do anyway, it's like an insurance policy for your business, so you don't get sued to oblivion. Um, and mm -hmm. when it comes to cameras and uh, oh, oh, so besides that, like cameras are easy. Install those. You should have that anyway to for for quality those are control your business. They're super. Yeah, cheap. yeah. Nowadays, I mean, nowadays cameras are dirt cheap. I mean, even television sets right now. I saw an eighty-five inch TV the other day for like three hundred bucks, and it's like yeah. so technology like that is cheap, 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 cheap. So you can go yeah. on Amazon.com. And we personally, by the way, we don't we don't require you to 
get any of this through us. Like, so if any our martial arts studio out there already has all these things, or you've already done all these things independently, all you have to do is just show us proof that you have, and we can accredit you. Um, so you don't have to buy any of this from us. But if you need help with it, like we were working on getting it, so that way it's a button click to get all of your, your CPR certification taken care of. We're working on it so that way it's a button click to get your background checks taken care of. It'll alert you and say, hey, a year has passed. It's time to re-up your background checks because that little accreditation check mark is going to go away as, as soon as it expires. Um, by the way, your mic is really loud, so I can hear you breathing. I can hear you uh, swallow. <laughs> like it's, it's up. <laughs> oh, my God. Is that better now? I don't know yet. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> if you hear me deep breathing, let me know. Um, no, I, gotcha. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought you liked the sound. What's that, what's the call when they have uh, people who like l listen to the sounds um, of like oh, people ASMR. chewing? ASMR. AS I thought you liked that, so that's why I turned it on. No, I thought you were that kind of thing. I remember pass, watching God the Matrix, it. the the Matrix, the original Matrix in theaters, and it gets to the part where he's talking about: Is the steak real? Does it taste like steak, or is it just like an implanted thought of what steak is supposed to taste like? But during yeah. that conversation, it's you can hear him nose breathe the entire time and you can hear him audibly smacking the steak. And I was like, I'm about to leave this damn movie theater. I can't do this shit. <laughs> I gotta go. Good, it was rough. To... <laughs> Are, do you have like super sensitive hearing in general? Like do you listen really, really closely to things? Like obviously my mic might've been really high if you could hear that, but it's just in general. Oh, it's much better now, by the way. Um, No, like I don't uh, okay. think so. Like I, uh, I was born with a cleft lip and palate. So I have a lot of like ear, nose, throat issues. And my ears, especially on airplanes, just get wrecked. Um, I went to go to the doctor to find out what's going on with my, my hearing. Um, my hearing is okay. It's not the greatest, right? But my right ear and my left ear had tubes in them when I was a child. And my left ear, obviously, they naturally just kind of fall out. But my, my left ear has like a slight a microscopic tear, like in the eardrum, like super microscopic, like so, super small. But because of that, uh, when I go on airplanes, uh, the decompression, like when you start to, to land, my left ear, completely fine. Like, it's almost like it doesn't, because of that little tear, it helps, like, the, the pressure depressurize on my ear. My right ear, on the other hand, is excruciatingly painful almost every time. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I look like I'm about to, like, attack someone on the plane because I'm, like, having to, like, work myself through the pain. It sucks so bad. It's the worst. So what do you do? Like earplugs or something? Does that help? Nothing I can do it's about it. Worse. When I went to the doctor to find out, they were like, yeah, like it would cause, it would most likely cause more damage to your ear than good if we went in and tried to do some type of corrective surgery on it. So you just have to suck it up. And I was like, ah, oh, that sucks. Like, so every, and I travel a lot. So like every time I'm on an airplane, I'm going to have to deal with this. And it's a roll of the dice. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all. And I'm like, all right, sweet. Sometimes it's so bad, like it bothers me for days afterwards. Like I, I still, I'll be decompressing. I'll yawn or swallow and I can feel pressure leaving my ear uh, days after. And then sometimes oh, it'll like God. feel like a, like a zit. I don't know if you've ever had one of those zits. It's like really deep and like you try to squeeze yeah, it, yeah. but it's just not happening. And yeah. then eventually it yeah. does and it feels so yeah. much relief. That's feeling, what happens. Yeah. It feels like, oh yeah. So sometimes it'll just be pressure, 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 almost unbearable pop. And I'm like, oh, God, I can breathe again. Thank God. Uh, but yeah. Do you, do you tell the people rough, next man. to you in the airplane? You tell the people next to you in the airplane? No, like, yo, no, that's no. Look like just... a psycho. I'm... But you got a free frame, I think. Like, yo, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to look like a psycho for the next, like, 30 minutes. Like, one ear. Like, like don't worry. <laughs> just pressurize. Uh, I like, you know, I think it's a good, uh, it's it's like a, almost like a, maybe it's strange, but I have to keep try to look at it in a positive way because there's really nothing else I could do about it. So I'm trying to make the best out of it. But it's almost like a practice of like like being able to have self-control. It's like this is the worst pain I'll ever be in in my life. So I'm just going to breathe through it, accept that this is happening, and try to like keep my head in a clear space, and then it'll go away. Like I, I have to do it every time I fly. So I just prepare myself. Oh, and by the way, the, when the, when the, uh, the pilot, starts to say, hey, we're about to start our descent. They've already been descending. 
I know because I could feel it. <laughs> They've been descending for like 15 minutes. They're lying to Those lying bastards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're about to start our descent. Like you've been to, like we know. Yeah. I could feel it. Yeah. You know, I, I know what you've been up to, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've been descending. We know it. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, yeah. I expose people for a living. I know what's been happening. Uh, so, so tell me about. <laughs> So the uh, you said you're vice president, so you have like a partner in this, or you're doing it with a company that already existed. Like how did that how did that happen? Yeah, so uh, Milton, the guy who runs um, BJJ Dummies, he founded the company. It's a five hundred one c, so it's a non for profit. Um, and he gave me a phone call like one day out of the blue. I was working with a company called Operation Smile. Um, I work closely with them. I help kids with cleft lips and palates. Um, but when I was over there, I just got a random phone call from him. I'm like, oh, man, I haven't heard from him in a while. So we were talking and he pitched over the idea. And I was like, to be honest, people have asked me for years to do something like this. I don't have the infrastructure to do it because it would require a team that I don't have. Um, he was like, well, I actually do have that infrastructure. I have a couple businesses. I have like a team. We can make this happen. And then we kind of have been going back and forth. We have our board meetings. Uh, we have. Uh, a director for PR. We have uh, like two or three staff for social media and uh, making sure that our content gets edited and posted. Um, you know, it's it's been a really cool collaborative process. I I had a meeting with him yesterday. I just got back from Boca Raton where his podcast is. Um, and then we had like a two hour conversation over lunch about where we think that the because we know we want it to be a website. We know we want it to be as automated as possible. The goal is to make it simple. We know that, um, you know, let's be honest, like in the martial arts industry, a lot of martial arts instructors, that's all they ever really know is martial arts. So we don't want to make it super complicated for them. We want to make it very easy. Um, and we're very aware, by the way, that there are going to be schools out there that just won't do this um, for whatever their personal biases are. Maybe they themselves have some type of criminal history and they don't want anyone to know this, which of course is the entire point. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, they themselves don't feel comfortable with one of the list, whatever the case may be. Um, but the goal isn't to shun any of these schools. We're not telling people where to train, where not to train. What we are doing is creating an accreditation system. So when someone goes on there and they that studio meets all of those check marks, like we talked about before, they get that documentation that says they are legitimately academy safe for, because they met all of those criteria. If they miss a criteria, we won't certify them as academy safe, so they won't get that blue check mark, that thumbs up, that certification, that badge. But what they will get is still the listing. If they don't have any of these things, they'll still get a listing because the goal is to to put them up and make the consumer start looking at things differently. If we can get the consumer to walk into a martial arts facility and say, hey, are you guys academy safe? And they say, absolutely. And that eases the consumer's mind about the, the nefarious things I have to deal with with McDojo life. Then maybe we can start getting a change to happen in the dynamic of how martial arts businesses operate in general. Just mm -hmm. because you can kick and punch somebody well does not mean you're a good person. It does not mean you should be a mentor to people. I mean, it does not mean that you have all of these virtues that we assign martial arts instructors for no reason, just because they have a black belt on. Honor, integrity, respect, discipline. They might not have any of that. Like, <laughs> just being able to beat someone up does not mean anything. It's actually a very low on the totem pole thing. Uh, if I'm at a board meeting and it's me, the head of HR, the head of R&D, and we're having this board meeting, and everybody's like, oh, oh, oh be quiet. The janitor walked in. He can beat us all up. Let's hear what he has to say. That has never happened in the history of any board meeting because that is such a low totem pole thing to do. Go to any prison in the United States and you'll find a bunch of people who can fight very well. Do they have honor, integrity, respect, discipline? Well, I'd imagine not. That's probably why they're sitting in jail right now. So our goal here is to shift the ideologies in this pop culture idea that these are holier than thou people. We're not. As a black belt, I am not, like as I've seen many other black belts, are not. They're just people, and this is a service. And we should start looking at it that way, so that way we can start protecting our students. If they get something like, oh man, I had this great uh, lesson today that changed my life, that's awesome. That is awesome. That is great. That is very, very cool. 
That's not what's on your paperwork, though. Your paperwork doesn't say, all right, when I sign up, I'm going to have some at least one life-changing lesson this entire year while I chip. No, the, I'm going to provide you a service as a martial arts instructor, and you're going to pay for that service, and that's it. Um, so our goal is to make sure that people are safer based on facts, not like, oh, that's a belt factory. They just give away belts. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, like, you know you hired a rapist, right? Just because you can beat people up in your jujitsu black belt doesn't mean that they're a McDojo. As a matter of fact, usually it's the opposite from what I've seen. What do you mean the opposite? Well, from what I've seen over the years, the first thing I had to do with McDojo life is in order to solve a problem, you have to define it. So, like, what is the problem? So, what is a McDojo yeah. is step one. So, I have to be able to define that word. And the only real things that you had to go off of when I first started was a thing called Bullshito Forums. And Bullshito Forums, for anyone who doesn't know, was just like an online forum, which back in the day, those were the most popular websites out there were forum websites. And it was just people complaining. That's all it was. It was like, oh, so-and-so got their black belt in like three years. So that's a McDojo. He's not real. I'm like, well, let's start analyzing these things. Because if that is one criteria that people say with a McDojo is you got your belt too fast. Well, BJ Penn got his black belt in like three years. Does that mean that he's magically not a legitimate black belt? Because you're saying over here that this is your standard. It has to take at least as much time. Oh, no, no. Well, he does jujitsu and he's an MMA guy. Oh. So the issue isn't too fast. It's they do an art you don't do. So simply because they do a different martial art than you, you're automatically wiping any credibility away, which is also moving on to the next part. So since that is subjective, we can't use that as a standard criteria because that's an opinion. That's not a fact. So then we go on to the next most common one, which is that cost too much. They charge too much. That's a McDojo. Well, if that's the case, then Lamborghini doesn't make good cars. Like, that, that they should be out of business because they're defrauding people. Like, no, they're not. They're charging what they feel they're worth. And clearly, there are people who can afford it because they're still in business. So if they were charging too much, they would go out of business because no one can afford it. But there are people who can. So we can't use this, you charge too much criteria, because again, that's subjective to the individual. What you can afford and what someone else can afford are not going to be the same. So we can't use that as a criteria either. And then the last one that I've noticed is skill-based. Um, you know, they'll go, oh, well, they're not very good. Well, as compared to who? Just because you're the champion of your dojo, the best fighter in your dojo, does not mean you're the best in your city, does not mean you're the best in your state. And just because you're the best in your state doesn't mean that you're the best in the country. Just because you're the best in the country doesn't mean you're the best in the world. There will only ever be one best at any one time. That's the word. <laughs> best. There's only one at any given time. Mm -hmm. So because of that, skill in itself is subjective. Yes, maybe you can beat this person up this day, but maybe you can't over here. People make fun of sport karate. Well, Michael Venom Page crushed Cyborg's face with a knee, and he's a point fighter. So are we saying that point fighting is garbage, even though he was able to do this? Or how about people who make fun of karate? Michael Venom Page, Stephen Thompson, Raymond Daniels, Boz Rutan, all karate black belts. So are we saying all of those people are no longer legitimate because they do something different? So again, now skill is subjective. So now that we've eliminated subjective, right, let's talk about facts. What are the actual issues? There are a ridiculous amount of sex offenders in the industry no one seems to care about. Some in incredibly high positions still to this day who we know were involved in sexual abuse allegations, yet people still respect them because they can beat people up. Some when you say, paid severance when you say pay. Ridiculous, yeah. When you say ridiculous amount, do you think more than like any other industry that where there's you know sex offenders who might you know work their way in and people don't notice or, or just you know don't do their due diligence? Like how could it be more than any anything else? Or because there's kids involved, they try well, to grab you said more out. than anything else. I didn't. Um, I think it's because. He, I didn't say more than anything else, but a lot of other industries do require background checks. We don't. So because of yeah. that, it's a, it's a haven for sex offenders. It's very easy to get into. No one's going to look into you on average anyway. Obviously, there are certain organizations that do require that good on them, but it's not required. So a lot of studios to cut costs don't do it, even though the cost is minimal. So I probably do a story at least two or three times a week 
on a martial arts instructor who molested a child. I would imagine that's too much. And an industry that is not that large. Not a lot of people on the planet, on average, want to go get punched in the face as a hobby. So the martial arts industry, yes, it, while it is global, it's still very niche. Um, it's still a very specific amount of people who do it. And then we also know because of CRM systems like Rainmaker, Mind, Body, Perfect, Mind, etc. They keep statistics for us, which is great. So we know on average, the average martial artist only lasts between eight months to a year and a half. So that means the majority of people who ever do martial arts ever are probably dropping out at about a year. The majority. The rest, if you last more than a year, congratulations, but you're the few and far between because most people only do it for about a year and then they move on. And that amount of time, how bad would it be if you didn't know anything about martial arts? Because a year is a very small amount of time. You join a martial arts facility based on assumptions. You assume that these are good people. You assume that this person in a position of authority over you has most likely done their due diligence for background checks and screening of instructors. You assume that these are required things. So you're automatically walking in at a deficit. You walk into a martial arts facility because you go, I don't know how to fight. Let me go to someone who does. So you already know they can beat you up. You're at a deficit. There's already a hierarchy. There's already a hierarchy. When you walk in, this is not only the person in charge, but they have a title given to them that everybody associates with them, whether it be professor, sensei, sifu, right? You have rules that are set. This is how you behave in my facility. And then you start going very hands-on. You're guaranteed to touch each other inside this facility. So when that happens, this person of authority who you know can beat you up, who is in charge of you, all of that puts you at a deficit. And you assume they want the best for you, which might not be the case. So that's the issue. It's not that maybe there's more or less. I'm sure that there are other issues out there, right? But all I know is this industry. And in this industry, because there's no regulatory body, I think that two to three times a week is far too much, in my opinion. So how do we solve these issues? Well, there's one or two ways this goes. And we already know what one does. And no one really wants that which is the government steps in. When the government steps in, they have a very bad track record of getting it right because the people who are making these, raw, these laws might not actually train martial arts. Statistically, since the average martial arts drops out at a year, they probably, if they ever did it at all, only did it for a year. It's not like we have like Henzo Gracie at the head of some board of directors over the government, right? We just have some dude named Steve who like probably did hockey or lacrosse Right. And maybe he did. He rode crew. That doesn't mean he understands the martial arts industry. So one example of bad government policy was the diaphragm bill in New York. So the diaphragm bill, for anyone who was unfamiliar, said that police officers in New York City were not allowed to apprehend assailants by putting pressure on their diaphragm. So bear hug can't do it. Bear hug from the front or the rear. Mount, back mount, knee on belly, side control. None of those things are legal for a police officer to do while apprehending you in New York. Feel free to look that up. So this is a knee-jerk reaction to a couple of other issues that had nothing to do with the diaphragm, by the way. So they put that in place. But a police officer can still shoot you. A police officer can still punch you. They can still kick you. They can still hit you with their car if it's necessary. They can still taser you. They can still hit you with a stick. There's plenty of other more violent, more lethal ways of hurting someone than sitting on them. So they took away the safest ways that you actually can apprehend someone. That's a stupid policy that's going to get not only police officers hurt and killed, but civilians hurt and killed. So that's the kind of thing we want to avoid with Academy Safe is let's go ahead and instill some type of regulatory ideology first before they step in. Because if we can start forming something now and say, hey, this is kind of universal, and then maybe we have like three or four schools, again, out of 10 that aren't doing it, then that means the majority are. So that means we're still making the industry safer for people. And again, it's not required. So if you do not want to do that thing, you do not have to. What we don't want is what was going on in like North Carolina, South Carolina, where they were actually trying to regulate martial arts itself. Luckily, those bills did not pass, but it could be a slippery slope. And so we're trying to help avoid that by, hey, we should probably all as an industry start holding ourselves to higher standards. 
So that's really the goal. I remember we posted after our last episode a clip about regulation and the comment section went wild. Like all martial arts school owners who had criminal backgrounds and hired other people were like, we can never have it, blah, 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 blah. It's like, are we here to protect our kids or make you feel better about yourself, right? Yeah, well, yeah. So like, you were, yeah. Uh, it bothers me so much because the people who were against background checks from the comments that I have read don't understand how background checks work. It's ridiculous. Requiring a background check doesn't mean because you have something on your record, you won't get hired. That's not how background checks have ever worked, ever. It's up to your employer to decide if you are able to be hired or not. Like, I can tell you, I worked at McDonald's for a while. There were criminals up and down that place, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, they got hired. Why? Because they could hit a button and flip a burger. Like, it wasn't difficult. Now, when it comes to martial arts, don't you think we should have a higher standard than just some dude who flips a burger? Someone who's in charge of your children? Like, the goal with the background checks mostly is to get people, one, who fraud people. So if you have, like, fraud charges and you're going, hey, I want to hire this guy as a manager, don't you think you probably don't want the guy who committed fraud around your money? Now, it's up to you. You can still hire that guy, You but now you know. Or how about... If you wind up hiring somebody who is a convicted sex offender, well, there are laws about that. He has to tell you, like when it comes to Megan's law, for instance. So like Megan's law states that the sex offender, if he's working around children, has to tell the employer, is it illegal for him to work around children in California? Not at all. <laughs> he can work around kids. It's, it's wild. Now, don't you think that as a parent, you would want to know if there is a registered sex offender because there are definitely people out there who are working around kids right now who have rape charges, who have sexual offense charges against minors. So if you're worried that background checks might catch you for doing this, I can understand why you might not want background checks. But if you have some weird ideology that background checks are bad, you're an absolute moron. I don't care who that is. Feel free to message me. If you anybody can message me about this, if you think background checks in the industry that has zero regulations at all is a bad thing, you're an absolute idiot. And what's going to wind up happening is somebody somewhere is going to wind up getting taken advantage of in your area. And over the last 11 years of doing McDojo Life, over a decade of just McDojo Life, there's story after story after story, and they all sound the exact same. We knew this guy for years. We trusted him. He was around our family barbecues. We had such a tight circle. We only make our instructors teach if they've been in our industry forever, if they've been under, under our lineage for X amount of years. But if you didn't do the background check, you have absolutely no clue who this person really is. So you're guessing. And not only are you gambling with your business, but you're gambling with the safety of the people's lives who are paying you money that trust you to protect them. So if you don't want to do background checks, that's fine. Don't do background checks. But don't say it's a bad idea because you're just waiting for it to bite you in the ass. You mentioned something earlier about North Carolina, some martial arts bill or something. What was that about? Yeah, I have to, I have to look it up to, to be able to, to cite it. But there was some legislation that they were trying to pass. Um. And while we chit chat, I can look it up and we can come back to it whenever I have it. Okay, cool. Um, and then you mentioned something also about confirming people's lineage, where they got their, their belts from or their certifications from. So how do you actually confirm that someone got their belt where they said they got it instead of just, oh, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a black belt from no one or I, I gave themselves a black belt? Well, it's very simple. So like uh, uh, the, the social network is already out there. So we already have the infrastructure to do it in a very easy way, right? Let's say hypothetically, you say you're a black belt under me and I'm still alive, right? What will wind up happening is you're going to wind up signing on to the site and saying, I am a registered black belt under so-and-so. That is going to wind up sending a message to so-and-so. So-and-so can then confirm or deny that you are a black belt in their organization. It's that simple. It's a switch. It's yes or no. So for us, we already know that definitely there are lineages where people have passed away, right? At the top of almost every long lineage, there's someone who has passed away. But luckily for us, 
those lineages already were documented. So we can look and say, okay, well, you say you're a black belt under Jigoro Kano, right? Okay, well, we can track that lineage. It's very easy to track. So-and-so, 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 and then we have the people who are alive. The people who are alive, we can connect to the people who have passed, and then everyone under them says, I'm a black belt under so-and-so. It's really a simple system. Um, you know, it's there are certain lineages in any martial art that will probably die off, right? That's just like any family tree. You know, sometimes someone doesn't pass it on or the head instructor passed away too early. Well, at least we'll have like a lineage if that's true or not. If we can't connect to your instructor and we can't connect your instructor to their instructor, what winds up happening is that's where you start finding hiccups. So if they can't, if we can't verify, which is actually very easy to do, that you are a black belt on your so-and-so, then what winds up happening is we can't accredit you. That's all there is to it. We're not saying that you're not. We're saying that we cannot approve it. We can't actually say, yes, we have verified your lineage, no matter what you say. Mm. So mm. that's the goal is to make sure. And then obviously once the infrastructure is set in place, it just takes care of itself. Mm. Did you find out the North Carolina thing? You know, because we're talking, it's like chewing gum and running at the same time. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I was going to be impressed, like, if you were going to do that. Um, yeah. So, the b besides Serve Safe, you also mentioned, um, oh, did I say that right? Uh, sport, uh, Safe Sport. Safe Sport. I don't know why I said Serve Safe. Yeah, Academy, Academy Safe, safe is sport. the organization, but, uh, uh, you know, you have Safe Sport certification and Safe Sport. Um, Okay, I think I might have found it, but I have to look deeper into it. Um, okay, but anyway, we can, we can do it like time. deep diving into a random one-off thing that I was talking about. Uh, but anyway, yeah. so for like Academy Safe, we have like a certain uh, credentials to be able to be fully accredited as Academy Safe. But Safe Sport's one of them, and overseas, Safe Sport in certain countries is required. So as a coach, you have to do Safe Sport. It's not even just like a question. So over yeah. here, because we have no regulatory body, that's a good start, you know? And mm -hmm. again, we cannot predict future behavior. There could be somebody out there who was squeaky clean up till now, and then they wind up doing something bad. We can't predict that. It is impossible. We don't have Miss Cleo working for us to predict whether or not, you know, you're able to, you're going to commit a crime later. All we can do is try to keep people from joining the industry as instructors in positions of power who have. Yeah, I mean, the main thing I do now is I teach martial arts school owners who have kids programs how to recruit new students organically, so without paying for, without having to pay for ads or fancy website. And the way I do that is through what I call the Triangle Codex, which is recruiting students through schools, daycares, and businesses. So yep. go directly to the source where all the people are. And because most school owners, they don't even, they don't know how to do it. Or they've tried as a gym teacher for a day, or they've gone and done a bully seminar, but uh, or maybe they'll go for like once a week for six weeks, but they don't really get much out of it. They don't get like actually convert students. So I teach school owners how to do that. Um, but usually the schools will require that they have a background check, right, to go in there and teach. And it, it shocks me. I almost like forget. Like, wait, wait, you don't have that? Like you've been running a school for five or ten years. You're like, okay, go get that like right now. And everyone in your mm -hmm. staff, like, you need to go get a background check. Like, how are we going to do any of these programs if you, you, you can't submit something to the, the school or the, the Board of Education? So that's usually mm -hmm. one of the first things I'll do. Uh, because, if you listen, if you're working with kids, I don't know what else could be more important, right? Um, and then the other thing you mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about was you're getting sued and you're, you're filming the lawsuit. Uh, and I think the lawsuit might have just started last time we talked. So give me an update what's happening. Yeah, so I actually got the cease and desist letter on my birthday, like almost two years ago. So I've been in like a year and a half. So when's your birthday? I'm like on my birthday, like when on my it? birthday, so I'm your sitting, birthday? April twelfth. Hmm. So I'm sitting in my office, and all of a sudden I see because my window is right by my front door, so I can like see my front door. So I see a lady walk up, and I'm like, oh, it looks like the mailman. And then they ring my, my doorbell. I was like, oh, okay. So I get up and it's a process server. And they were like, are you so-and-so? And I've seen this process server before. It's not my first cease and desist, right? But, you know, I was like, oh, so I, hey, how's it going? Yeah, another one, blah, 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 right? So I move on with life. 
whenever that happened, I wound up looking at it, and they were trying to sue me. I have it right here, one of the many. Um, they were trying to sue me, saying that I uh, defamation a character. Um, what was it? Yeah, defamation. They were trying to say that I was like a business that was competing against them. There you go. Uh, first cause of action, defamation. The second cause of action, unfair business practices under California Business and Professional Code, which is hilarious because I'm not a full-time martial arts instructor. Like, technically by trade, my job right now is investigative journalist. <laughs> I just happen to put the stories on YouTube. But I'm on the East Coast. He's on the West Coast. And he was trying to accuse me to say that I was, like, trying to, like, steal his students away and, like, ruin his business. Like, I never told anybody not to go to his business. <laughs> I told people the truth that he hired a sex offender. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, inter interference with prospective economic advantage. So, like, I was trying to stop his business. Um, and as then, far, as, far as, your, as far as you're concerned, the last one, I, I, so did this person know that they hired a sex offender? I mean, I, I don't absolutely. think there's an excuse, but yeah, they know. Hands okay. down. Absolutely did. So, like, the funny part is he tried to sue me for defamation and he tried to say he didn't know, which is the funniest part of the whole thing. Because he during the videos that I did put out, I'm one of those people, and this is a good little note for anybody out there who watches any of my breakdown videos. I never put all the information out. I always hold on to some information on purpose just in case they fire back at me. I almost always have enough for another story. Like, I just put out a story first to let people know some of the more important facts. And then I hold on to the rest. And I just keep it next to me like a little pet. And then whenever they decide they want to fire back, I go, oh, okay. Well, I can answer and you respond like that. Because I've already done my research. I'm a good journalist. I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm good at that. So he winds up, I wind up putting out a story. And the story originally was not even about him. It was about the sex offender named Gary Snap Ferguson. And Gary Snap Ferguson, if you type his name into Google, it's like the first like two pages of Google is nothing but like his sex offense. <laughs> like there's a full story that was run locally there in the local news, a uh, full video of it. Like, uh, like uh, he's online. He was at the time online all over the place, like advertising and trying to become Internet famous on TikTok. And he was I think he had like 48,000 subscribers on TikTok at the time. So he was like not hiding from the public, right? He was very open about being a sex offender. He almost mocked people for it. He mocked me when I called him out. So whenever that story hit, I interviewed this guy. His name's Brian Antac. He runs Brian Antac's Kempo Karate in Bakersfield, California, for anybody that wants to know. But Brian Antac hired him. So I put out the story. And during the story, I interviewed Brian right there on public forum like in a comment section on Facebook. So it's all completely public, the, the information, right? There was a something that was released on TikTok, which is like a screenshot of a conversation between him and Brian, alluding to him knowing that Brian was a sex offender. So I put that screenshot up. So I wind up putting out all this information, and then he winds up getting a second video. And the second video is him responding to me, saying that I lied, right? Even though that's just not how that worked at all. I provided evidence that you could see in the videos of everything that I said. So then I released another video after that, that said all the things that he said that was a lie and again, provided facts and evidence. Um, he was like, yeah, he, he never taught around kids. I was like, here's photos of you and him teaching kids. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but that was our old facility. I'm like, here's plenty of photos and videos in the new facility. Like, what are you talking about? So he just kept kicking the lie down the road. Then he sued me. And then we've uh, been going back and forth. Two of the three causes of action that he's suing me for have already been dismissed. He owes me for that because of something called the anti slap rule or law, whatever the case might be, maybe. But anti slap if you sue a reporter frivolously, you have to pay back their lawyer's fees if you lose. So now he's having to pay back two thirds of my lawyer's fees. And we're still going back and forth with the third cause of action, invasion of privacy, still on the table. So he thinks because the judge has allowed this to kind of go to trial that he's just, oh, I'm going to win that case. Like, no, you're not, but that's okay. I'm willing to go all the way if you want. Like, it's an easy win for me. And then I still get to counter sue him uh, because the two or three causes of action got dismissed, causing me time, issues, emotional distress, 
Like clearly I'm not happy about the whole thing, right? So it hasn't been a fun process and it's a very expensive one. So now we're to the point where I have a lot of information. Like I re-released the story onto Instagram. So all the stuff that I'd already posted on YouTube, I just re-released it onto Instagram just to inform more people about what was going on. So when I released the information on Instagram, I had two parents contact me that completely 100% verified that he was absolutely lying and still lying. He says that he kicked out this guy at a very specific date and time. That date and time is when he said he found out and removed him from the facility. Well, I have photo evidence and a witness that is a parent there who said, no, here's, a, here's him teaching a class. Took a photo of him teaching the class with a timestamp and location stamp where the sex offender a year over a year, actually, of the time he says he kicked him out, still teaching kids' classes. Mm. Then another parent contacted me, and two years before he says he knew, that parent got a weird feeling about Gary. Googled his name and found him right there on Google for everyone to see. Confronted Brian Antak, the owner of the studio that hired the sex offender, who says he didn't know, and him, her, and her husband confronted him and said, hey, we need to talk. They talk to each other. They let them know that, let him know, hey, this guy's a sex offender. He said, don't tell anybody about it. Keep this quiet. We'll remove him from the kids' classes. This is two years before he says he even knew. So now when I counter sue him into oblivion, all of that information gets to go out. And here's the grossest part. Here's one, the grossest part about the whole thing. Gary Snap Ferguson winds up getting with a minor during this time. That minor was taking classes at Brian Antak's Kempo Karate. That minor winds up being in a photo doing a technique called Monkey Steals Peach. Now, anybody who's not familiar with Monkey Steals Peach, it's where you grab someone by the crotch and squeeze. There's a photo of her grabbing Gary Snap Ferguson in a private lesson at that martial arts facility by the crotch. Labeled oh Monkey my God. Steals Peach. By the way, that person, the, the when she became of legal age, they announced they were dating. So Gary had access to this child at Brian Antax Kempo Karate. Now, I'm not saying that's where they met. I'm not saying any of that. But he did have access to her during that time at that facility. Meaning, she is clearly on video, clearly training there clearly grabbing him by his crotch, a sex offender in this martial arts studio that Brian Antak gave him access to. So at the end of the day, this guy continues to try to lie, saying that none of this is true when there's evidence after evidence after evidence of it. So I cannot wait to depose this man. I'm going to depose him and I'm going to depose Gary Snap Ferguson. And what's going to wind up having to happen is one of them is going to have to perjure themselves because if he's going to continue to lie, He's going to wind up perjuring himself. If he says, hey, mm. I did not know. I didn't know whatsoever. Okay, well, I have evidence you do, so keep saying that lie, because now you're going to be held, you know, now you perjury's on the table, so congratulations on perjuring yourself. And then Gary, do you really think, with Megan's law, which states that he had to tell his place of employee or place he volunteered that he was a registered sex offender, do you really think he's going to continue that lie just so he can go back to jail? Yeah, I never told them. Okay, well, I guess you never told them. So since you didn't do that and follow Megan's law, I guess you need to go back to the slammer. He's not going to do that because he doesn't want to go back to jail. So at the end of the day, the, the guy, Brian, does not understand where all of this is going to go. And I've given him every opportunity. I have not countersued yet to continue to give him every opportunity to stop. At about the first $10,000 of this lawsuit, I said, hey, man, you should probably stop. Like, anti-slap is there. Like, you understand, like, if you keep doing this, you're racking up your bill, not mine. And every time he's taken the losses, he continues to try to continue down the path of lying. So either he's a, not a very intelligent man, or he's just a habitual liar and can't help it. If he's a habitual liar, he's about to lie himself into a very heavy debt. So it's a, it's a very strange thing to have to go through. It's very emotional. It's very stressful. It's not fun. None of it. Um, cause uh, you know, even though he has to pay back the money, I still have to pay it up front. So it's not, and it's not cheap. So at the end of the day, it's one of those things that while we were filming our documentary came up and I was like, oh, 
we got to film this. So if his goal ultimately is to not be in the spotlight for doing the thing that he did, he's literally doing the opposite by dragging this out. Mm. So now that you're filming it, is that something that like the attorneys allow you to do? Like any evidence he submits or like, what are you actually allowed to film as part of all the process? So obviously conversations between myself and my lawyer, I can't really film like that. I can't really film any of the deposit. I can't, I can film the deposition. I can use all the deposition footage, however I want. So that's awesome. Um, I'm pretty sure I can film in court during the trial as long as I have a, a court reporter. Um, and then uh, I can't film any of the hearings, but I can obviously give the results of the hearing. So like as, after, as soon as the hearings are done, I just do a little testimonial, like a video testimonial right. and say, hey, this is what's happening. So the process is still very transparent. And mm. I haven't really talked about it much up to this point because two of the three causes of action that we talked about were still on the table. So I just it's smarter just not to say anything. But now those have been dismissed. I can talk about them all I want. So hmm. so do you have attorneys on um, on retainer for all these times you get sued or people threaten you legally? Are you just unfortunate to it at this point? Yeah. I mean, okay. most of the time, I've never been officially sued except for this time in the last 11 years. I'm extremely thorough, always have been. I make sure that everything that I say, I provide evidence for. Very factual. You can look at the stories. And when I say something, usually right next to my floating head is a picture of what's going on. Um, All of that is extremely transparent. I do that on purpose. I'm not trying to pull wool over people's eyes. I almost never tell people not to train with people. Um, I almost never say don't go to these businesses. I almost never try to, to sway people's opinions about people. I just put out the facts. And I have my own opinions, of course. But when I have my own opinions, I say words like, I think, I believe, because those are on me. But I never put out stuff that is purposely unfactual. Like, if I see something, I put it out. That's just how it goes. Do you consult with other investigative journalists, maybe in other industries, to, like, yeah. figure out good strategy? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, sometimes. Like, um, there's a guy um, uh, in Indonesia. He does almost exactly what I do, but he does it just in Indonesia. And uh, he sends me all kinds of crazy stuff. Like videos? Uh, like some of the videos you repost? Like that's what he'll send you? Sometimes. Like I've seen some pretty horrific stuff come out of there. Some of the worst stuff I've seen ever has been out of Indonesia. It's, uh, mm. it's kind of like the, it's like the peak of fraud. So like in India, for instance, <laughs> India has a lot of frauds. India has frauds, but they're different. Like, they'll be like, I'm doctor, author, director, actor, martial arts instructor. Like, they'll be jack of all trades, right? But they're clearly full of shit. Um, So, like, they're just, it's full of frauds there. Uh, Like, Tamil Nadu, I think, is the area. Um, But then you have, like, let's say, for instance, um, uh, Indonesia. Indonesia has, like, extremely harmful and dangerous things that get people killed. Like, I've seen uh, someone sent me a gang rape. It was a bunch of martial artists all wearing their martial arts T-shirts, and they just they gang raped a woman. Um, obviously, in order to do that story, that was very tricky, especially because of Instagram and Facebook's policies and procedures. So being able to get that story out there, I had to piecemeal it together on my stories. I got a full confession out of the kid. Like, somebody confronted him in public after I put it out there, and he confessed to it being a rape. But unfortunately, the police there were extremely corrupt and they were able to basically pay off the police like they have. There was video footage of both of him and his mother going into the police station and just leaving, even after he had a full confession on tape that he did this. Um, He confessed twice. I still have it on my phone. Um, The other thing was uh, I've seen an eight year old kid slit his throat and kill himself because he believed in uh, uh, an inner power like a Tanaga Delam. Um, He didn't know. That this practice called Debus, Debus is like self mutilation without harm. He didn't seem to be aware that it was a magic trick. He thought it was real and cut himself and slit his throat. Um, oh killed himself. There's a very famous video online of an uh, Indonesian Salat practitioner who was doing Tanaga Dalam type practice and was like putting an energy field over his arm and then like took a machete and whacked his arm and just starts profusely bleeding. 
Like he believed that he could stop this like machete from hurting him because of his spiritual practices. Or I saw uh, uh, this video still online. You, anyone can look this up. There's a video of a, a Salat demonstration. All these kids are laying down on their stomachs in a field and the camera zoomed in. And the camera starts panning out and you start to see all these people who are surrounding this demonstration watching. And then you see a truck and then you see like a wedge right in front of the, the, the kids. And the kids are between the ages of like what seems to be like 12 to maybe 16, 17. And the truck drives up onto this wedge, but the wedge is higher than the kids. It's not like flat, like the old trick of just running them over straight, right? So the truck goes up on the wedge and just lands on the first kid and immediately seems to kill that child, runs over the second child, and then the truck stalls. So the, the truck, for whatever reason, stalls and they can't get it to start again. So the truck is just sitting flat on this kid. Third kid just gets out of the way. Then the truck runs over the rest. The rest don't seem to be harmed, but the first two, they can't revive the first kid. The second kid, they're able to revive, but he looks extremely hurt. This is all under martial arts umbrella. From the gang rape, to the kid who killed himself, to the to ones who uh, got run over. This is all out of Indonesia. This is what happens when you don't call out nonsense. It winds up becoming accepted. And when we accept it, we, turn to, we tend to look a blind eye. And it's already happening in the United States. We already know major organizations, even in legitimate arts like jiu-jitsu, have accepted plainly that their head instructors have raped people. Are they been involved in rape? Are they been involved in sexual abuse? And still turn a blind eye because they can go to ADCC. Or paying $50,000 severance pay to a rapist. Turning a blind eye when they flee the country to get away from the charges. Like, this is supposed to be honor, integrity, respect, discipline. It's bullshit. And it's all because they're good at jujitsu. Who gives a shit? That's what I say. I could care less. And at the end of the day, I think that by us turning a blind eye to these little things, we're turning a blind eye to a lot more than just the little things. And that's going to build up. And when it builds up, it's going to destroy something so beautiful. Martial arts will not be the same. And it's already going that way. So what are we going to do about it? No one seems to give a shit because it's not their problem. I'm going to worry about my students. And I'm going to make my students the best. And that, that's all just petty. It's not petty. Like, I can't imagine anyone, if you brought up any of the things I just talked about, saying, oh, that's petty that you complain about that. If you feel mm -hmm. that way, you're an enabler to the issue. In my opinion. So I'm sure you thought about this before, but obviously, like, um, you know, police officers, when they're looking around and they're not on duty, they feel like everyone's a criminal. Like, they can have that kind of, like, feeling because they're always around it, right? They're always around people committing crimes. Um, so they're extra, I don't know, cautious or uh, maybe some paranoia. Do you feel like maybe the – for you, because you're around this all the time, it's what you investigate, it's what you look at, maybe uh, – excuse your perception of like how bad it really is you ever, i'm so i'm assuming you thought no. about that before whoa no yeah Not i bad. wish that was the case i wish like hold on where is it so this this is just one list of stories i have to go through hold on let me see if i can find another one this is <laughs> a story right here about a sex offender i have to go through um, I get people who contact me almost every day about someone who was inappropriate inside their workplace, inside the martial arts facility. There's two or three stories that are already on national and international news about rape allegations that have already taken place. Um, I did a story one time on YouTube that's an hour and a half long. Feel free to look it up. It's an hour and a half long made up of like 15 to 30 second news or uh, news videos, martial arts instructors who raped people. It's an hour and a half hmm. long. <laughs> like. At what point is it paranoia? And I understand mm. what you're saying, right? Like maybe I'm hyper vigilant to it, so I think it's worse than it is. I wish that was the case. But if that was the case, how am I still in business? When mm. I have just run out of stuff to talk about, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's not the case, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll always be scumbags and, uh, and con <laughs> artists. So, unfortunately. Well, th well thank you so much for. for yeah, thank you so much for doing this. If someone wants to reach out to you, how do they find you? Oh, yeah, man. McDojo Life pretty much anywhere on social media except for Reddit because some douchebag took McDojo Life and is posing as me. Um, so on Reddit, it. it's the McDojo Life. 
you'll see it very clearly. The McDojo Life has my logo on it, and it has like almost 100,000 uh, members of that Reddit thread. Uh, the other one has like 2,000. <laughs> Yeah. I make sure every time I see a post over there, I go over there to just remind people, hey, just as a reminder, this isn't the actual page. Like, just go to our real one. So, yeah. And congratulations on the YouTube award for over 100,000 subscribers. It's freaking awesome. Woo -woo. Thank you. Let's I go. <laughs> on about, uh, when I first got it, I was like, I should put it on a necklace and just, just like walk around with it for like a week. Uh, damn. <laughs> that sounds awesome. All right. Catch you later. Thanks for being on here. Appreciate you, man.